We are in a series of messages called Why Jesus? And we're asking why Jesus, oh wait, I've got one more thing, I'm sorry. Cain, I'm catching myself right now. Uh, it's an important announcement, okay? We're still gonna get to Why Jesus. But how many of y'all going to Michael W. Smith concert? Anybody planning on going? Okay, I wanna encourage you to go because our band is opening up for Michael W. Smith, all right? So it's really cool. February the 8th, did I get that right? Uh, the tickets are like 29 bucks. Uh, they can get, where do they get them? Can you just stand up and yell? Okay. He spoke Australian, so you probably couldn't understand it. So meet him out there later and, and we'll talk, okay? I was afraid I was going to forget that. Now, we're in a series called Why Jesus? And people are asking the question about why is it that we should believe in Jesus? In fact, we're asking the question, why should we believe in everything? We're in search for answers. And those questions that we ask are the basis for our belief system. We're wanting to know where we came from. Uh, were we created by God or did we just come into existence somehow? We're wanting to know what is our meaning and our purpose in life. We're wanting to know if there is uh, life after death, if there is life after death, what is it like and how do we get there? These are some of the basic questions that all of us have, whether you believe in a God of creation or not. And when we look at that and we think about this, the word search, it is connected for the beliefs that we have. And the beliefs form the foundations of all religions. So why should we choose Jesus? Because we know that there are a lot of people choosing a lot of other things to believe in. I was uh, looking at some statistics here recently about that, and I was really shocked and surprised about what people believe in around our world. Uh, as I thought, Christianity is uh, the religion or the faith that is followed most around the world. I, I believe that it is actually true. But what I didn't know is how close the other religions are becoming toward Christianity. I'll give you some examples of that. Christianity, there are 2.4 billion people who believe uh, in our faith which makes up 29.81% of the world population. The Islamic faith, there are 1.9 billion who believe in this, and there are 24.6% who believe in the Islamic faith. There's only five percentage points different between the two. That really surprised me. I knew it was getting closer, but that surprised me. With secularism, non-religious, uh, agnostic, atheist, it's all clumped into one. There are 1.2 billion people, which is 13.91%, almost 14%. When it lumps those together, those people or people, people who say uh, there is no God or I don't either believe or not believe in a God. I just maybe, maybe not. That's how they believe about it. Of those in that number who are atheists who say they don't believe in God at all, there are 500 million, which makes up 7% of the world population. In Hinduism, there are 1.15 billion, which is 14.28%. Buddhism, five, uh, 521 million, which is 6. 4% of the population. There's actually more people who are atheists than are Buddhist, but there are still significant portions of our population that believe in these things. Why do they believe in these things? Because whatever those beliefs are, answer the questions for them. So why would we believe that Jesus answers the questions better? Because there's one particular thing that is different from Christianity than all of the other religions. And it's for that reason that we would say, I need to choose Jesus. It's what I need. And that's what I want to talk to you uh, about today. I need what? What is it that I need? Well, I'm not going to tell you the answer to that right now. We're going to hear it actually at the very end of the scripture of the message today. I want to read a passage that we've been using uh, throughout this uh, series that talks about Jesus and his importance. When we talked about creation, we learned that Jesus was from the beginning. In fact, in John chapter one, verse one, it says, in the beginning was the word. word the word means Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus, uh, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. So, and in other words, at creation, there 
uh, uh, the world, Jesus was there. We also hear more about Jesus and what he did when he came to the earth in the flesh. That's what I want to read to you right now. It's on your outline sheet, or you can follow a, along on the screen. It's John chapter 1, verse 14. The word, in other words, Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Everybody say grace and truth. Grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in close, closest relationship with the Father has made him known. The word relationship is the important word. What we're looking for is a relationship with God. Many of the other religions don't provide a relationship with God. This is a difference in a certain belief system. I've also shared with you in previous weeks that when you look at all religions, they can be categorized in four different ways. One of those uh, would be naturalism or materialism, which says this, uh, there is no God. All right, we just got here by some other way, but there is no God. These would be atheists uh, who would fall under this category. There's another called pantheism. You remember this. Pantheism says, I am God, uh, you are God, the tree is God, the plant is God, the, the bird is God. We're all interconnected with one another. And people who are pantheistic are people who believe in reincarnation. And if you look at religions that we're familiar with, it would be Buddhism and Hinduism and other Eastern religions like that. There's a third category, which is deism. And deism says there is a God who created everything, who created the universe. But that God is not personal. We can't have a relationship with this God. Some of the Greek religions or Greek mythology connect that. They come up with names of Zeus and other people who were created, but there's not necessarily a means where we have a personal relationship with these gods. And then there's the fourth, which is theism. And theism says this, there is a God who created us, but we can have a personal relationship with this God. And there are different religions that believe this. The Islamic faith believes that that you can have a personal relationship with God. Judaism believes that, and Christianity believes in that. But there's a big difference between Christianity and the Islamic faith and the Jewish faith. All of us believe we can have a personal relationship with God, but it's the way we have the personal relationship with God that's different. In the Islamic faith and Jewish faith, it's about following rules or following laws. If I follow the rules and laws, then I can be connected with God. If not, I am condemned and even condemned to death. But in Christianity, it's much different. And as I go through this, I'll talk about that uh, more. As we look uh, at Jesus, we understand that not everybody believed in him when he came to the earth. Now, what we're going to do is to see why people believed in him. And I'm going to share with you a story in just a moment uh, that helps us understand this, that helps us see through the life of a person why we would come to believe in him. Now, as Jesus did come, there were a lot of people who didn't believe in, in him, and he came as a Jewish man, and many of the people in the Jewish faith, some of them came to believe that Jesus is who he said he was, that he was the Messiah. But there were many Jewish people who did not, especially the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, uh, and other people who were there. They saw Jesus in a very different way. Even though Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, they didn't believe that he was the Messiah. They believed that he was the most influential false prophet that they had come across who was teaching something that was leading people to believe something that they believed was not true. And here's the reason why they didn't believe he was the Messiah. They believed that there were certain things that would have to happen when the Messiah came. So if the Messiah is the Messiah, then these certain, you know, periods of time or these uh, issues would come about in time. One of those was when the Messiah comes, then all of the people who are Jewish will come back to the homeland, that all the Jewish people would be back in the homeland. Well, even though there were some in the homeland, not all the Jewish people were back in the homeland. The second thing was this, that when the Messiah came, he would begin the building of the temple in Jerusalem that had been destroyed. 
So they believed the Messiah would do that. The third thing they believed was that when the Messiah came, that he would bring in a period called the Messianic period, which was a period of peace. In other words, when he came, there would be no more war. Uh, this Messiah would sit on a throne like uh, a king. And because of him, not only would there be no more war, but everything would be good and there would be no more evil at all in the world. So they look at Jesus and they're like, none of that's happened. He claims to be a Messiah, but not all the Jewish people are back, right? The second thing is he hasn't started anything about a temple. And the third thing is there is definitely not peace on this earth because there's plenty of evil going on. But what they didn't know is this, that Jesus came not to build a temple. He came to build the temple of God who is us. We are the temple of God. What they didn't realize is this, that even though they say Jesus would bring peace to all the earth, there would be no evil. What they didn't get was Jesus is the one who came to us so that we could defeat evil and there would be no more evil in us. It was a different way for them to think, but they would not believe that he was the Messiah. Well, this caused a, a huge problem for them and they wanted uh, you know, to get rid of him. But there were some people who were standing up for Jesus. You see, there were some people who, who did believe that Jesus was real. And again, I talked about this before, but it's all gonna connect here in, in a little while. Some people believed in Jesus, that he was from God because of the virgin birth, right? Because there's only one way there could be a virgin birth from God. It's that he was a part of the conception and it wasn't two humans doing it. Now, a lot of people would you know, question that. It's like, okay, you say it's God, it's a virgin birth. It has to be from God uh, to be able to do that. But they honestly are like, did that really happen? Because seriously, these two people could have hooked up and, you know, they're just claiming this. The second thing uh, was this, that people believe in the resurrection of the dead. Okay? Uh, that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And there's only one way that could happen would be through the power of God, a God who was in control of nature, who could bring it back into existence. That's why people believed that Jesus was from God. And that's actually one of the main reasons we're in here today, right? Because that belief started and carried on from generation to generation. But here's the deal about the people at this time. He hadn't been resurrected yet. Okay, so that wasn't really a thing. There was a third part though. And it was called the miracles. Jesus did miracles and people looked at those miracles and they couldn't come up with any other explanation other than he was from God. And because they believed this about him, the message about Jesus began to spread and his influence became strong. So the Pharisees, the leaders, the teachers of the law wanted to stop this message. So they came up with a grand scheme. And the grand scheme was this, to go get the temple guard, these official people who were, you know, like guards, military people, whatever. And they asked the temple guard to go find Jesus and to capture Jesus, to seize Jesus, to arrest Jesus, and to bring him back to them. So the temple guard goes and finds Jesus, but they don't bring, them, bring Jesus back. They go find Jesus, and then they, you know, after being around him a little bit, they come back, and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law ask them, where's Jesus? They said, well, we found Jesus, but then he started talking. And we really liked what he was saying because it made a lot of sense, you know, about God's love and how he loves us even though we don't do the right things. And he's the one who brings peace in our heart, that we're the temple of God, that he's the one, you know, that allows us to have a relationship with God. It really sounded good and we just couldn't bring ourselves to arrest him. So here we are without him. Well, these people obviously were very concerned about it and thought, well, you know, if the temple guard didn't believe... I wonder if other people like us, Pharisees, started believing in him. So they asked, he, they, they asked him, were there any other Pharisees who turned away from our belief and began believing in Jesus? And they were like, no, no other person. But there was one person who spoke up who was amongst us, who's a Pharisee like us. And uh, his name was Nicodemus. If you were here last week, you remember me talking about Nicodemus? Basically, the whole message was about Nicodemus. A lot of it was. Nicodemus spoke up. Now, let me tell you, just re, you know, tell a little bit of the story from last week. Nicodemus was a part of the ruling council. He was one of the main dudes who was over the Pharisee uh, you know, 
government or whatever you would call it, didn't call it. He was way over that, but he obviously was questioning his own belief system. Because at night, he sneaks out away from where the Jewish people are, where, those, where they're hanging out, and goes to find Jesus, okay? It's dark. He doesn't want anybody to see him. He goes and finds Jesus. And he has this conversation with Jesus about who he was. And this is what he said to him. He said, it's basically what I just said a minute ago. He said to him, I know you're from God because there's no other explanation for you're being able to do the miracles that you've been doing. Didn't I just say that a minute ago? I know you're from God because there's no other explanation for this. So they get in this big conversation. Okay, that's where John 3, 16 is a part of that conversation. For God so loved the world, he gave his not only begotten son. I'll get in that in a minute uh, as well. Uh, anyway, they had this conversation. And what we believe, you know, is that Nicodemus believed what he said, that he had a change of heart. But, you know, it kind of, brings into question that a little bit because now Nicodemus doesn't, you know, begin claiming Christ or any of those kind of things that we know of. He's still a Pharisee. He, he's probably still part of the Jewish ruling council. And here he is in this situation. But here's the reason why we believe he really was changed in heart because he spoke up. When people were wanting to condemn him and capture him, he spoke up and he said this, does not the law of Moses tell us that we should not condemn anyone unless we give them the right to be able to speak about what they're doing? He knew what he was doing. He knew exactly who Jesus was. And by him saying that, gave the opportunity for Jesus to continue talking about what he was doing. And you know what? I really think that Nicodemus, I'm using my sanctified imagination here, okay? I really think that Nicodemus saying that statement, giving Jesus even more time to talk about who he was, might have been the turning point for these soldiers who went to try to get him. So here they are. Okay, we're stuck. Okay, we still want to arrest him because he's causing a problem. So let's come up with another plan. If we can get Jesus to publicly uh, make a decision that is against the law of Moses, then we'll have a reason to arrest him. I mean, if we can publicly get him to say something contrary to the law of Moses, then it'll be obvious to everybody we need to seize him, all right? So they come up with this plan. They're trying to figure out what can we get him to say? What situation can we put him in to get him to say something? So they come up with this plan and we read about it in the scripture. It's found in John chapter eight, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, listen, okay, it's what I just said. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They're trying to get him to say something against the law. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Oh, so I love this story. I want to teach you some things through this. And the first thing is what I just said. Here are some lessons. I want us to look at the actual teachings. So on your outline sheet, let's fill that in. It's the teachings. There are contrary teachings in the scripture. There's a teaching that Jesus gave and there are teachings that the religious people gave. Well, let me go back to the very beginning and read to you a scripture that I already read. It's the first passage that I read to you. Out of his fullness, remember Jesus came in the flesh, right? Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. Here it is. For the law was given through Moses. In other words, the religious people say this. 
Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We see both religious systems in that one statement. So let's talk about Jesus first. Jesus, what he believed and what he taught was grace and truth. On your outline sheet, fill that in. It's grace and truth. Grace, obviously, is love. Grace is giving uh, things to people that they don't deserve. I've shared with you the last two weeks, again, another definition of grace. Grace means favor and goodwill, which means I favor you. I care about you. I'm concerned about you. And it also means goodwill. It means to do something good for you. So if there's something bad that's happening to you because I care about you so much, I want to do something good to help fix it for you. Well, this is the thing. We all have problems and we do things wrong, right? So in grace, what Jesus does is he looks at us and says, wow, uh, man, I really care about you, but you've done these things wrong, so I want to do something good to help fix you. That was the basis, really, of the whole conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. I want to read John three sixteen and verse 17 to you. It says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What Nicodemus believed, he came talking to Jesus. In his mind, he is a Pharisee. He's a part of the ruling council. And this is what he believed. I am to follow the law of Moses. The only way I can have a relationship with, uh, the, with God is through following the law of Moses. If I don't do it, I'm condemned. And this is what Jesus said to him. Jesus said, look, even though you sin, you shall not perish, but have eternal life. In other words, let me speak truth to you, Nicodemus. You are loved even though you are imperfect. And I will do what I must do so that you will live. How many imperfect people out here do we have this morning? Do I have an amen out there? Aren't you glad that Jesus spoke the truth? John 3, 16 is the truth about, and it, y'all, basically this is it. A lot of times when we read the scripture, we don't get it. Jesus is telling people this. Following the law doesn't work. You'll be condemned if you follow what everybody else says. But through me, there is love and there is forgiveness. How do we know that? Look at verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Y'all, this is exciting stuff right here, isn't it? It's God's grace and God's truth. We hear another verse in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. In other words, there's no way you can save yourself. First of all, if you could, it'd just be about you and not about God, but you can't even do it. So therefore, you need grace. You need favor. You need goodness. You need somebody to do something for you that you don't deserve so that you can be forgiven and not perish. That's what it means. That's what they needed. Well, there were other teachings. We just talked about the teachings of Jesus, grace and truth. I want to talk to you about the other teachings. There were uh, other people, other groups of people there. We already have heard about two of them, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Those two really, the teachers of the law were also Pharisees. The teachers of the law just had the responsibility to teach okay, what the Pharisees believed, and they were considered to be a little bit higher in rank. Those two groups of people, okay, they were all Pharisees. But there was another group of people also that were Jewish, and they were called the Sadducees. Jewish groups, but had two very different belief systems. Let me talk to you about the Sadducees. Well, the Pharisees believed you had to follow the law to have a relationship with God. But the Sadducees had been influenced by an outside source. The Romans had come in, and they had taken control, and they were over the people. But with Roman, Rome, uh, the Romans coming in, they brought something with them, another belief. And it's called Hellenization. I know that's a big word. Hellenization comes from the word helos, and helos means Greek. So this is what it means. They brought within, with them, the Romans, a Greek culture into the society. That's what the Romans would follow. And that Roman culture began to influence people who were Jewish. Those were the people who became the Sadducees. Now, what did they believe? 
When you look at their belief system, we understand that instead of uh, them listening to the teachers of the law, they listened to the oracles. And the oracles were these people who would tell them how it is that they could remove the bad things in their life to connect with whatever spiritual being you want to be with simply by chanting these things. So the oracle would tell them what to chant. Uh, what they would also do in Greek culture is they would, uh, they would use uh, charms and they would use figurines and they would use those things almost like we would think in witchcraft today to control the circumstances that happen around them. They also would use astrology and look at the stars and the moon and how it is that uh, the, the stars move within the universe and the sky and they would use that to determine somebody's character or the direction in which they were to go. Well, these Jewish people started believing all this stuff, the Sadducees. Now, there were a couple of groups. Again, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago too, but again, it all, it all connects. There were, some, there were two groups of people who were Jewish Sadducees that had some different beliefs even related to that, okay? Two groups of Sadducees. One group followed the teaching of a guy named Epicurus, and Epicurus was a Greek philosopher, and this belief was called Epicureanism. So some Sadducees believed in Epicureanism. What Epicurus taught was this, that the greatest thing in life is pleasure, and the way to experience pleasure is through indulgence. So that's what they taught. So if you're gonna be happy in life, you need to experience as much physical, whatever pleasure you have, and indulge in it. Then there was a different, which was completely the opposite, came from another guy named Zeno, and Zeno was also a Greek philosopher, and his followers, uh, it was called Stoicism, or they were Stoic. And what he said was this, that we should control ourselves. we have the ability to control ourselves to not be moved by anything in life, therefore being able to control our emotions in all circumstances. Basically, we're all we need. You ever heard somebody say, they're so Stoic? You ever heard somebody say that? But they just never change. They like this. Nothing ever affects them. That's where this comes from because they feel like they are in charge, you know, in control and they can do this. So the religion or the belief of the Stoics was I'm all I need, therefore I need no one else. And then the, the, the religion of the Epicureans, okay, was it's all about me and about pleasure and getting as much as I possibly can and indulgence. All right, so what I want you to do this was the religion that was going on at this time. Y'all are getting all this stuff? It's just kind of setting up the scene here. The religion, the religious people taught two things. They taught control and pleasure. That's what I've just been saying. I'm just giving you a way to write it down. Control, I'm all I need, or I'm in control of my future, and pleasure, it's all about indulgence. Now, it's not just the Greek system that believed this. It wasn't just the Sadducees that believed part of this. The Pharisees also believed in the control part of it because they said, I can control my destiny by my ability to follow the rules and the laws. So that's what it was. Now, I don't know about you, but doesn't that sound exactly like our society today that people are either trying to control themselves and don't need a God or they're living for pleasure? You could apply those two things to all the other religions and all the other categories that we've talked about today because that's what they're being taught but what we know is those things don't work. Okay, so let's get to the next part. The question, what was the question that was asked? The question was this, what do you say? It's exactly what they said, what do you say? Law of Moses commanded that any, any adulterous woman who's uh, you know, caught doing this should be stoned. What do you say? Okay, I have a question. Where's the dude? Where's the guy? The scripture said she was caught in the act of adultery, which means there was a dude, there was a guy, yet he's not up on the stage being condemned, just the woman, which is a huge thing for us because this is something else we learn about the Jewish society at that time. People didn't have the same value. Men were more important and valuable than women. But let me just tell you something today. That ain't true. Do I have a witness out there from anybody, right? We are all the same in the sight of God. The dude should have been up there too. I really wonder who caught him. I don't even know who did that, all right? But he should have been up there too. But yet it, here it is. It's women. So what were they thinking? In their, I want you to get this. Just get in their head, Pharisees. I'm better than other people. 
I'm better than that woman. I mean, everybody knows that. I'm a guy. I'm better than that woman. That's why we can throw her up there. I thought about today, I thought it'd be kind of fun to get one of you to come up and, you know, confess some sin that we could just insult you the rest of the time. Wouldn't that be a lot of fun, all right? That's basically what they were doing. Well, Jesus didn't answer them. He made a statement. So I wanna to talk to you about two statements. And one statement is the statement that Jesus made to the religious people, and another statement is a statement that Jesus made to the adulterous woman. So let's look at the statement. It says this in verse seven. Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. That was a statement. I wanna give you a Tim paraphrase. Okay, here's the Tim paraphrase. This is what you're gonna fill in. Let anyone without sin judge. Okay, that, I think that's a good paraphrase. That's what exactly what you, you you just throw it at her. You're judging her. I, I was reading also uh, recently uh, some other statistics about young adults. And we're trying to reach young adults through downtown and through other, and we're trying to reach everybody down there, but other, other places as well. It was interesting to me to see why young adults have left uh, the Christian church. And the first reason was, and this is kind of a practical thing, most of the you know, young adults left because they went off to college or did something else and they just never got reengaged. 34% of the people, okay, young adults. Second was this, 32% of the people left the church because they felt like the people in the church were hypocritical and judgmental. 32%, that's a third, okay? Almost, 33, okay, I'm not, whatever. 32% of the people left for that reason. Why? because they feel judged. Yet that's not who we're supposed to be. Now, I want you to, again, get the scene. Here's Jesus. He's up there. He's talking to them, right? He's, he's doing this thing. And then he asks them, you know, whoever's without sin, cast the first stone. Okay, let me, let me get into that a little bit. When they asked Jesus the question, uh, what should we do? Or what would you say? Jesus kneels down uh, and he starts writing in the sand. And a lot of people say that he was, uh, you know, writing the sins of the people who were condemning her in the sand. I don't know if that's true. It sounds good, but he might've been doing that. It might've been he was following the principle, think before you say. Okay, he might've been doing that. But here's the third thing that may have happened. The scripture not only says that they asked him that question, but then it says this, they continued questioning him. It wasn't one question. They kept on questioning him about this. I don't know what the questions were. Obviously, they must have been about this woman. Like, why should we let somebody like this go who's been blatantly doing this against God? Or why should we let somebody go who's like this who would do something to destroy the family of the person that she had a relationship with? Why should we do this? Let me tell you what they were doing. They were digging a huge hole for themselves. It's exactly what they were doing. They were saying all this stuff and now Jesus has an opportunity to speak to them about all that stuff they just said. Whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. This, this is the, I really love this part. I want you to think about the young guys. The young guys were there with them. The Bible says uh, that they you know, began to think about this. They began to think about it. This is what happened. Uh, he makes this statement and he kneels down again and he starts writing in the sand again. So before they were talking and accusing and now they were silent and pondering. In other words, if I were up there on the stage like this woman and told people what I had done, what would they want to do to me? So as they thought about this, people started to leave the older to the younger. So I think about the younger and think, these are the guys that are supposed to be setting the example for me, the Pharisees, and these are the guys who are supposed to be teaching me how to follow the law. And by them walking away was an admission that they had sinned themselves. They dug themselves this huge hole about this girl and what she had done. And then when Jesus confronted them about it, they knew it was true about themselves. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know what Jesus did through all that? He pointed out the problem between the two religions. You believe you can follow rules and know God, but you can't follow all the rules all the time. 
because we're sinful. But we can experience forgiveness, which leads to the second statement. And this is the statement that he said to the adulterous woman. Look at it on your outline sheet. It says, here's the scripture, then neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. I don't condemn. Put that in, that's the statement. I don't condemn. How do we know that? He said this about himself in John chapter three, verse 17. We already read it. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I'm not gonna condemn you for what you did. Okay, coming, and the last three are gonna be pretty fast, okay, so don't, don't fret. We're coming here to the end. All right, I shared before, there were three reasons why people believe that, that Jesus was from God and they should listen to him. The virgin birth, remember that, the resurrection, which hadn't happened yet, but the miracles. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that this adulterous woman saw any of that or experienced any of that. This is what she experienced, Jesus, and what Jesus did in his actions toward her. This is what we need, every person needs to choose Jesus. What do I need? I told you I'd finally get to it. What we need, what is it? We need compassion, don't we? I mean, think about the other religious, I mean, the other religions that they were talking about. What about a compassion? Kill them, condemn them, do whatever. We need somebody who loves us, who's compassionate for us, who truly is a messenger of God. Buddha's not a messenger of God. He's not both God and man. Uh, you know, all of these different religions, they're not formed on those things. We need the one who can connect us. What did the scripture say at the very beginning of this message? It said, there is no one better than the son of man who is in closer relationship than God, with God. Isn't that cool? We need him. So how does he show his compassion? Throw him down on your sheet. Here it is. First of all, he accepts us. Out of his compassion, no matter how bad you are, he accepts you. You're excited about that? Say amen. amen. Second thing, out of his compassion, we learn this, that he forgives us and doesn't hold our sins against us. He didn't come to condemn, he came to save. Remember what I said about grace. Grace is uh, giving favor to somebody. You're important, no matter what you do, you're important to me, and it also means goodness. So because you're important to me, I don't want you to suffer, so I'm gonna do something good for you. I'm gonna take the judgment, the condemnation for you. You are sinful, we're all sinful. I'm gonna take that for you, for us, and I'm going to die for those sins. That's what Jesus did so that we could be forgiven. Third thing is this, that he gives us a purpose. We are to live loving. This is how we're supposed to live. Jesus said to the woman, go and sin no more. Why would she? I didn't get into this part of the scripture because I knew I wouldn't have time to do it, so I'm just gonna say something about it really quick. I've talked about this a gazillion times. What is sin? Sin is not treating other people the way we wanna be treated. So what he just said is, go and treat everybody the way you wanna be treated. Go and live loving. That's a simple, easy way to put it. We're to go and live loving other people. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.